I'm Anita Wu and you're watching Nightline, news making the headlines. Dato Sri Najib begins 12-year jail term after failing to overturn guilty verdict. Our headlining story, Datuk Sri Muhammad Najib Tun Razak started serving his 12-year jail sentence on Tuesday after the federal court had on the same day upheld the former Prime Minister's guilty conviction and sentence in the SRC international case. The Apex Court also denied his request for a stay of sentence. Chief Justice Tun Tengku Maimun Tuan Mat led a five-member Apex Court bench, which also comprised Chief Judge of Sabah and Sarawak, Tan Sri Abang Iskandar Abang Hashim, and Federal Court Judges, Datuk Nalini Pathmanathan, Datuk Mary Lim Tiam Swan, and Datuk Muhammad Zabidin Muhammad Dia. Reading out the unanimous decision of the court, the CJ said the trial judge correctly held that all the ingredients of the seven charges were established at the close of the prosecution case. Datuk Sri Najib was thus rightly called upon to enter his defence on all seven charges. The CJ stressed that during the trial, Datuk Sri Najib did not dispute that 42 million ringgit entered his personal bank accounts. The thrust of his defence was he denied knowledge that the funds were from SRC. On Datuk Sri Najib's statement that he was framed in a conspiracy hatched by one Lo Tech Jo or Joe Lo, Aslin Alias, Nick Faisal Arif Kamil and the bankers, including monies said to come from donations from Saudi Arabia, the prosecution had always maintained at trial that these defences were completely inconsistent and completely opposed to one another. In the federal court's judgment on Tuesday, the findings of the High Court on the defence are correct. In concluding that the defence failed to raise reasonable doubt on the prosecution case, the bench found that the High Court judge had undertaken a thorough analysis of the evidence produced by the defence. The bench also agreed that the defence was so inherently inconsistent and incredible that it did not raise a reasonable doubt on the prosecution case. The Apex Court also found Datuk Sri Najib's complaints, as contained in the petition of appeal, devoid of any merit. The court found that Datuk Sri Najib's conviction on all seven charges should be intact and that the sentence imposed was found to be not excessive. The federal court then unanimously dismissed the appeals with the conviction and sentence affirmed. The decision also means that Datuk Sri Najib is automatically disqualified from his seat as the MP for Pekan under the federal constitution. Meanwhile, Datuk Sri Najib's lead counsel, Hisham Te Potek, who appeared dejected, short. said the defence was saddened by the federal court's verdict on Tuesday. We are very sad because we lost the appeal. I only say that we seek comfort and solace in the words of a great Indian jurist who said that the Almighty alone can dispense perfect justice. When asked by reporters so if he would be filing a review of the verdict, he said that Thank he you. would discuss the matter with his team. Uh, I would not be able to say it now, but uh, we will be discussing the possibility. Thank you. Datuk Sri Najib was appealing his conviction by Judge Datuk Muhammad Nazlan Muhammad Ghazali on all seven charges brought against him for abuse of power, misappropriation and money laundering involving 42 million ringgit of funds belonging to SRC International, for which he was sentenced to 12 years imprisonment and fined 210 million ringgit two years ago. With the decision, Datuk Sri Najib becomes the first former Prime Minister in the history of the country to be jailed. On July 28, 2020, he was convicted on all charges and sentenced to 12 years imprisonment and a fine of 210 million ringgit. The hearing of Datuk Sri Najib's appeal commenced on August 18th after the federal court spent Monday and Tuesday of last week hearing his motion for leave to adduce fresh evidence to show that Datuk Nazlan ought not to have presided over the trial due to an alleged serious conflict of interests. That application was dismissed on Tuesday afternoon. Upon its dismissal, lead counsel Hisham Te Potek applied for the hearing to be postponed, citing insufficient time to prepare his arguments. That application was rejected by the Apex Court. When the hearing began on Thursday, Hisham apologised to the court and asked to be discharged from representing Datuk Sri Najib as he was not ready to make his submissions. The bench rejected the request and directed him to continue representing Datuk Sri Najib. Since the Defence Council was unable to make his submissions, the CJ called an ad hoc prosecutor, Datuk V. Sitambaram, to deliver his submissions. 
the prosecution closed its submissions at the end of last week. It was on July 3rd, 2018, that Atatsui Najib was arrested and charged the following day. His trial was conducted at the Kuala Lumpur High Court over 79 days between April 2019 and March 2020, with a total of 86 witnesses having testified. On December 8, 2021, a three-member Court of Appeal panel, chaired by Dato Abdul Karim Abdul Jalil, unanimously upheld his conviction and sentence. In a later development from the Putrajaya court complex, Datuk Sri Najib was taken to the Kajang prison in Selangor. He was escorted into the complex just after 6 p.m. A crowd had congregated soon after news broke that he was sent to the prison. Police are currently monitoring and handling the situation at the Kajang prison. Members of the media have been barred from entering the prison complex. Meanwhile, Datuk Sri Najib's daughter, Nuriana Najwa, has vowed to keep fighting until her father is back with the family. In an Instagram post on Tuesday, she wrote that her father did not get his day of justice at the country's apex court. She also apologised to her father and said that his family was proud of his strength during the case. The Chief Registrar's Office of the Federal Court has lodged a police report regarding the draft copy of Datuk Sri Najib's SRC International Case Appeal written judgment, which was leaked. In a statement issued on Tuesday, the office referred to a report published in an online news portal which contained a working draft of the judgment as well as leaked documents that had been modified. The office pointed out that an internal investigation has begun and confirmed that the document was a working draft that had not been finalised. The statement also read that the final judgment was only delivered in open court at about 4 p.m. on Tuesday. It also said the leak was a deliberate act to jeopardize the integrity of the court's operations and the administration of justice, adding that the judiciary will not be affected by such illegal acts. Meanwhile, several UMNO leaders have expressed their sadness over Datuk Sri Najib's fate on social media after the Apex Court dismissed his final appeal against his conviction and sentence in relation to his SRC international corruption case. Party President Datuk Sri Ahmad Zaid Hamidi, in a statement posted on his social media account, stated despite Tuesday's outcome turning to a sad moment for the party, it does not mean that UMNO will give up its struggles. He also expressed his hope that Datuk Sri Najib will have the perseverance and strength to face this challenge. He also called on party members to stand in solidarity with Datuk Sri Najib. In a tweet, AMNO Secretary General Datuk Sri Ahmad Mazlan pointed out that it was Datuk Sri Najib who selected him to be cabinet member. He also expressed hope that the case would be reviewed. Brasatu President Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin said that the federal court's decision reflected the justice and independence of the country's judicial system. He added that this was also a victory for Malaysia in its fight against corruption in the country. However, he reminded that this was not the end of the fight as a number of high-profile corruption cases, including the misappropriation of 2.6 billion ringgit from 1MDB funds, have yet to conclude. On the other side of the political divide, PKR President Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim also welcomed the federal court's decision, which has proven that the nation's judiciary is independent and not influenced by political power. The parliamentary opposition leader in a video message added that this also proved that the people were in power, adding that if the people decide wisely, including the youth, then the atmosphere and political climate can change. Project delays, shortage of skilled workers, and less access to building products and materials. How do property developers manage these situations effectively? Intensify global supply chain disruptions. Will input costs remain elevated? Money Matters speaks with Bandarim Bayu Sindrian Burahad this Saturday at 5 p.m. on TV Tiga. Back to the bulletin. The government will ensure that 2023 budget is prepared with the people's well-being at its core by taking into consideration the challenges that await next year.
Prime Minister Dr. Theresa May al-Sabri Yaqob said among the main focus of the budget is to ensure post-COVID-19 recovery, which will include the creation of jobs, an increase in income and the survival of businesses. Meskipun pertumbuhan ekonomi negara untuk tahun 2022 berada pada trajektori pemulihan yang memberangsangkan, namun harus diingat kita masih lagi berdepan dengan prospek ekonomi global yang semakin mencabar untuk tahun 2023 berikutan konflik Rusia-Ukraine yang berterusan, gangguan bekalan makanan global serta tindakan bank-bank pusat dunia yang memperketatkan dasar moneteri mereka. He was speaking at the closing of the 2023 budget consultation program at the Finance Ministry on Tuesday. Dajit Sri Ismail Al Sabri said the government would also pay attention to a safe and comfortable living environment by emphasizing inclusive and sustainable development. The Prime Minister said various issues and challenges were raised during the consultation, with methods and solutions being proposed to tackle all those issues to be studied in detail. He said he is also confident that the post-COVID-19 economic recovery momentum will continue until the end of 2022, enabling the growth forecast of between 5.3% and 6.3% to be achieved. The Agriculture and Food Industries Ministry, through the Federal Agricultural Marketing Authority, is targeting a sales potential of 7 million ringgit in conjunction with Malaysia Fest 2022 in Changi, Singapore, starting this Thursday. Its first Deputy Minister, Datusri Ahmad Hamza, said the four-day expo returns with the involvement of 80 companies to showcase 3,000 agro-food, craft and tourism products. Kali pertama kita telah adakan pada tahun 2016 dan tarikh terakhir, kali terakhir kita mengadakan expo ini ke Singapura tahun 2019. Jadi selepas dua tahun kerana COVID, kita tak ada, di tahun ini kita telah mengadakan sekali lagi. Datuk Sri Ahmad also said the fifth edition of the Malaysia Fest is expected to attract 90,000 visitors this year. He added, among the products that are expected to receive high demand are the Trunganu Kropot Leko, Amplang from Sabah, Opa Ubikayu from Johor, Sarawak's famous layer cake and many more. In 2016, Malaysia Fest recorded a total sales value of 4.15 million ringgit and in 2019, it had increased by 60% to 7.3 million ringgit. When we return, Thai PM faces calls to quit over term limit. Do stay with us. Project delays, shortage of skilled workers, and less access to building products and materials. 
How do property developers manage these situations effectively? Intensify global supply chain disruptions. Will input costs remain elevated? Money Matters speaks with Bandarin Bayou Sindrian Burhad this Saturday at 5 p.m. on TV Tiga. Welcome back onto the foreign front. Former Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison's secret appointments to ministries during the COVID-19 pandemic has fundamentally undermined responsible government despite it being legally valid. This is according to advice from the country's Solicitor General, which current Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said was a very clear criticism of the implications for Australia's parliamentary democracy. In a written advice, Australia's second highest law General officer was critical that, that Morrison's Morrison appointments to the ministries were not made public, saying it was inconsistent the with the system of responsible government uh, prescribed the by the Constitution. Uh, the Solicitor General had said his ministerial appointments were valid, but there was no consistent practice to gazette such appointments. Uh, Thus, Albanese said his cabinet had agreed uh, that there will be a need for a further inquiry into the matter to answer questions on how the unprecedented assumption of power occurred and the need for reform. The Morrison, in the meantime, said he had acted in, in good faith mind, to protect Australia in the face of multiple of crises. As I would walk into question time every day. Thailand's Prime Minister Prayut chan cha left Government House in Bangkok after chairing a weekly cabinet meeting and cancelled a meeting with Vatican envoy, apparently to avoid confrontation with protests outside. Protesters are calling on chan cha to resign as a court considers whether to take up a petition to rule on when his constitutionally stipulated eight-year term is up. Meanwhile in court, the main opposition party are agitating for his removal under rules limiting a prime minister to a maximum of eight years in office, a threshold they say he will reach on Wednesday. Prayut was army chief when he mounted a coup in 2014 to overthrow an elected government and became a civilian prime minister in 2019 after an election held under military drafted constitution. The constitution court is expected to come to a decision on Wednesday. However, if the case is accepted, it is unclear if Prayut would stay on as leader or be suspended from duty while a caretaker government takes over. The Islamabad High Court on Tuesday has issued a show cause notice to Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan and summoned him on August 31st in a contempt of court case following a weekend speech in which he threatened police officers and a judicial magistrate. A retired judge, Shaikh Usmani, in a statement said it is a criminal conviction, adding that the ex-leader could face six months in jail if convicted. The contempt issue is in addition to charges under an anti-terror law that police filed against Khan over what they said was a threat in his speech about an aide who faces sedition charges for inciting mutiny in the military. According to legal experts, the issue could be a threat for Khan, who has been campaigning for new elections since being forced to step down this year, since a conviction would disqualify him from standing for election. His political party, the Pakistan Tehreek Ian Saf, however, has dismissed the accusations against Khan as being politically motivated, saying they were being used to block him from leading anti-government rallies.
Welcome back with Sports News Now, Badminton, the 2022 World Championships. It was the end of the road for national men's singles shuttler Ng Zi Yong after he crashed out in round two on Tuesday. Ng, world number 42, who is making his debut in the world meet, went down fighting 9-21, 21-10, 19-21 to Thailand's Sitikom Tamasin in a one hour and 10 minute battle. The 2022 Commonwealth silver medalist showed great fighting spirit to bounce back to take the second game after losing the first, but he could not turn the tide against the world number 33 in the decider. In the women's category, national women's singles ace S. Kisona fell at the first hurdle when she went down to world number 80, Wu Ting Trang of Vietnam. Kisona was not at her best as she suffered a 10-21, 17-21 defeat. It was better luck for another women's singles shuttler, Sonia Chia, as she began her campaign with a hard-fought 21-19, 21-18 win over world number 44, Putri Kusumawardani of Indonesia. Sonia, who is ranked 40th in the world, can expect a torrid time next, as she will be up against fourth seed and 2020 Tokyo Olympics champion Chen Yufei of China. Meanwhile, top seed Victor Axelsson continued his winning form as he cruised to the round of 16 on Tuesday. The Olympic champion took 41 minutes to knock out Mark Kaliau of Netherlands in two games, 21-19, 21-10, at the Tokyo Metropolitan Gymnasium. In women's singles, Saina Nawal of India kept her good form and stormed into the round of 16. The former world number one outplayed Cheong Nan Yi of Hong Kong in two games, 21-19, 21-9. Coming up after this short break, face masks to stay on for now. Do stay tuned. matter of masks. Malaysia will need more time before deciding to go the way of Singapore and scrap the mask mandate in most indoor settings. Health Director General Tan Sri Dr. Nohi Sham Abdullah said that the country was not prepared to cast off the pandemic-era curb, often regarded as the front line in the defence against the airborne SARS-CoV-2 infection. Commenting on the nation's preparedness and relevant indicators to remove the mask mandate, Tansu Dr. Nohisham said that it remains status quo for now. He added that Malaysians will continue to comply to public health measures like wearing masks in confined spaces or crowded areas with poor ventilation. The public are also advised to continue cleaning their hands frequently and to maintain physical distancing if possible. On Sunday, Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong said that masks would soon be required only on public transport, where people are in prolonged close contact in crowded spaces, and in healthcare settings such as clinics, hospitals and residential and nursing homes, where there are vulnerable people. He, however, did not state or hint when the mandate would be dropped in the Republic. Outdoor usage of face masks stopped being mandatory in Malaysia as of May 1st. However, the public are encouraged to use them when outside, especially in crowded places. 
Sultan of Johor, Sultan Ibrahim Sultan Iskandar, said he would not be rushed into making a decision on the state government's proposal to change the state's weekend back to Saturday and Sunday. Sultan Ibrahim said he would make an announcement on the matter when he was completely sure and confident that it would be the best decision for the good of the state. In a statement posted on his social media account on Tuesday, Sultan Ibrahim requested for all parties to stop speculating on the issue or to urge him into making a quick announcement. Instead, Sultan Ibrahim wants the government to focus on Johor's economic growth for the benefit of the people. From January 1, 2014, Sultan Ibrahim changed the state weekend to Friday and Saturday as a mark of respect to Friday's importance to Muslims and a nod of recognition to Islam as the state's religion. On August 10, this year, Mantri Basad at the On Hafiz Ghazi tabled the state government's proposal to revert the state's weekend. More than 250 windsurfers graced the picturesque Lake Silva Plana in Switzerland during the 45th edition of the Engaden Surf Marathon over the weekend. The riders were competing in the IQ foil class, which will be part of the Olympic program for the first time in Paris 2024. Let's take a look at the event as we wrap up Nightline tonight. With that, I'm Anita Wu. Be well. Thank you for watching.